Hey, isn't that great music? I love it. Hi, my name is Marion Owen, and I'm honored and excited to have you guys share this time with me on this live event. It's my first one, so I'm so glad I'm doing this in front of a group of gardeners. So speaking of gardeners, let me know in the chat where you're from and what's your weather like right now? I know. Oh, here in Kodiak. Well, you'll see in a second. I'm going to show you today how to get started raising seedlings so that they're not all weak and leggy and they come out looking like the ones you see in a professional greenhouse. I mean, seedlings that not just survive when you transplant them, but really thrive. So here's what we're going to do today. I'll begin the training. And at the end, I'll share some exciting news about my upcoming Seed Starting Secrets workshop. Then we'll get to all your questions. So be having those questions run around your brain, jot them down. And then if any time while I'm teaching, a question pops into your head, write it in the chat and I'll devote as much time as needed to get to all your questions. So let's get started. All right, Tracy from Maine, that's fabulous. New Zealand, Catherine, oh, thank you so much from, whoa, on the other side of the planet. This is really great. Maine, I gotta make it to Maine someday, really, 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 because I'm on the coast and I know you guys are on the coast, so you kind of deal with some different kind of weather. So that's really what I'd like to do. It's on my bucket list. All right, let's get started. All right, Marge, New Zealand too. Are you guys, are you are you sisters or something? This is sharing your gardening. Um, Northern Illinois, what's your, what's your weather like there, Pauline? You got a little snow? Maybe not? We just got a little bit last night. So it's still, we're coming, getting towards spring. I'm so excited. Okay, let's dig in and we'll start with a happy face. <laughs> this is actually uh, broccoli that I grew and that little tongue is actually for real. It just grew like that. So you might be wondering, where the heck is Kodiak Island? Um, it's just, I like to say, it's a little northeast of Australia and north of Hawaii. And so um, with that, I'm gonna share with you what I do in every workshop. And that is to give you a little glimpse of what it's like where I am. Oh, this is from our upstairs window. Today is exactly what it looks like. We live on the ocean. All these beds are covered and um, spring is around the corner and I'm excited, but not everything is just sort of dull and lifeless because under here, take a look, we've got spinach and salad greens growing. Is that cool or what? So growing here is spinach. This is our favorite winter green because I can sow these seeds in September, whatever fall, you know, is giving me, I use that opportunity to start them and they grow a little bit, they get established. And then even though it might be bleh, zero degrees, 10 degrees below, whatever, we can be eating spinach salads in the middle of winter. So today's workshop is all about how to avoid those weak and leggy seedlings by following these tested tips for starting seeds. These are tips that I've worked on for like 40 years. So your plants, like I said, don't just survive, but thrive after you transplant them. And I mean this because this is for beginners, as in if you've never even sown or grown seedlings before. Now, I want to be fair here. I want to be honest because, you know, for example, I wouldn't try to tell someone in Kentucky how to grow watermelons, right? Any more than try to convince someone in Arizona or California how to grow one of my favorite plants, blue poppies. So in the 40 years of interacting with gardeners around the world, I've learned, we've learned that at the core of everything we do, there's a common path, a template that applies to everything. Does that make sense? No matter where you garden, yeah. So cool, let me know in the chat. Remember, if you just come on, where you garden, by the way, and what your weather is like. So 
doesn't, you know, a path that applies to everywhere and take seedlings, for example. Starting seedlings is a little bit like, oh, making a cake, right? Because you have to get all your ingredients ready, make sure you got them and make sure you follow the recipe exactly. Even these beaten up recipes that we all love, right? Otherwise, you ruin your cake. For me, what happened was um, <laughs> I put uh, salt instead of sugar uh, one time and it was a disaster. The other time I got to tell you this story is just like starting seeds and raising seedlings, it's that one little detail that can make all the difference. And basically your entire batch, in this case, seedlings can be affected. So I remember that I learned this lesson, just the stress alone can mean that for the rest of your season, your seedlings kind of languish along. Like you get puny flowers and stunted cucumbers or because they are weakened, they succumb to an aphid invasion. So when I started my first batch of broccoli seeds, I was so excited because, you know, I just moved to Alaska and food is expensive. But I started the seedlings, but at some point I forgot to water them. And when I finally got around to it, they were drooping, seriously drooping. I misted them with water and I gave them a drink. I thought, okay, they'll perk up which they did, but what I didn't realize was the damage I had done by not watering them at the right time and in the right way. So for a while, the seedlings looked fine and, and perked up, right? But a few weeks later, when I transplanted them, guess what? I never had broccoli. The stressed out plants bolted, that is they went to flower, basically threw up their arms like these branches you see here or stems and said, I don't have enough energy to do this. So before we go any further, <laughs> I have a little, I have a little favor to ask. And that is, I want you all ears, right? I want you to close down all your distractions, your Facebook, your email, uh, go pee if you need to. We're going to go through a lot of material. I want you to be fully present because there's a lot to learn today. And not just to learn, but okay, you got all your ears focused there. I want you to be able to take notes and make the best use of our time together. And I've learned one thing is what gets written gets remembered. So I'm going to take a sip of water here. Okie dokies. Let's dive in. All right. So when it comes to starting your own seedlings, if you're like most gardeners, you might have run into some challenges. Challenges like, oh, what's the best way to start seeds? Big question. It's a good question. Is it better to start seeds inside or outside? Boy, I dealt with this when I first started. I had no clue. I hadn't even, I hadn't even sown a lettuce seed before, right? I didn't even know what it looked like. How to know when to start seeds? This is a biggie because one time I started seeds while well, I was excited. Spring was around the corner. I thought, well, okay, I'm just going to do this. Well, I started them probably a month too early, too soon. And when I got around to transplanting them, guess what? Even though I potted them up twice, the roots were all spirally and they were suffering. So what did it do? My cabbage plants bolted. Challenges like how to know which seeds go straight in the ground. Ah, this is something that we all deal with now, particularly 
like get rid of those distractions kind of thing. I don't have enough time. I don't have time to do seedlings and plants and stuff. I tried starting seeds, but nothing seems to work. Oh, it can be so frustrating. I know. Then what if you've never planted a seed in your life? So I just want to tell you, if any of these challenges ring true for you, honestly, you're in the right place. So thing is, you know, if, if we fail to start seedlings, say at the right time, or we try to grow seeds that should have been tossed out years ago, or we grow them in the wrong mix, havoc can happen. By the way, note on that seed packet, the date on there, uh, we're talking about like 2018. So let me tell you a story. A friend of mine's daughter was getting married. And my friend, had, my friend had promised to not only host the wedding in her garden, in her yard, but to grow all the flowers for the bouquets, uh, those boutonnieres that the guys wear too, table decorations. I mean, we're talking thousands of seedlings here. The wedding was six months away. Now, this is a lovely, heartfelt promise, I got to say. And she was thinking of like hundreds of packets of flowers. She was, you know, making bouquets. And so she got right to work. Four months passed before the wedding, uh, uh, two months passed for four months before the wedding. Let's see, that's about right because it was, yeah, it was about six months out. Okay, she calls me on the phone and she says, uh, Marion, she was panicked. All my seedlings are dying, falling over. Like overnight they did this. And this is kind of what they look like. They're kind of sad little guys. I gotta tell you this. So, you guys, and some of you can guess what happened. She overlooked, there's a number of safeguards to take to prevent damping off disease, where the seedlings just keel over right at the soil line. And they just sort of, at the surface, they just keel over and die. So we found fresh seed. Uh, we started new batches of seedlings and they bloomed. We were very careful. I said, I was very careful to tell her what to do. Just in time for the wedding, the bride was thrilled and the guests were so impressed. So many things can cause a seedling to be stressed out, kind of like us, huh? But when we go to transplant these weakened seedlings outside, this domino effect happens. Your seedlings topple over with the first breeze. They burn and wither in the midday sun. The tiny little feeder roots don't make good contact. I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen. They just, they can lose battle to nematodes. Did you know there's nematodes that kind of burrow into the uh, roots? Ooh. So before you know it, your entire investment of time and money has gone down the drain. But you know what? In many ways, it's not your fault when things go wrong in the garden. It's not your fault that so-called experts gave you bad rap, like poor quality information, thinking they're helping you in the past. For examples, I, I learned when I was young that you're supposed to rototill your garden every year. This is what the experts said, rototill, till your garden, your soil every year. Now, thing is, new soil science has discovered that deep tilling like this is one of the worst things you can do for your soil. So I remember, for me, I remember about, let's see, well now it's about 30 years ago, I took an extension course, like from our extension service through our universities, the ag, ag department and universities. And I, I just took kind of a basic, uh, it was like a master gardener course, but it was kind of basic for me, I didn't know much. And um, I was really curious about growing things organically. But when I started asking questions like compost or manure, things like that, I was flat told by the teacher, like, shut up. We cannot talk about organic gardening methods. We can only talk about chemical fertilizers, fungicides, herbicides. Whoa. So I'm just, <laughs> I'm telling you this in a way because if you're confused and like discouraged, 
I totally understand. Kind of mixed messages, huh? So it's no wonder that we um, get a little confused when it comes to starting seeds. In fact, there is so much information out there. If you just Google start seeds, woohoo! Um, I'm going to talk about some of these points, but here's another thing to t consider is if you Google um, starting seeds or seedling care or anything along those lines, a whole heap of information comes up. So we'll get back to this too, because I know this is about starting seeds, but I know some of you have already done this before and maybe you just want a little refresher about seedling care. So there's a lot of conflicting information out there. In fact, I'll show you what I mean. When I was a guest on Ed Hume's radio show, now Ed Hume on the left in the purple shirt, um, he had a gardening show, TV and radio um, for the entire like West Coast of the United States. And he was like the gardening guru. And um, before we went on live on the radio, I asked Ed, he's a very gracious man. I just, I just, I love him to pieces. He said, so Ed, why don't more people grow their own seedlings, grow their own starts? And he kind of looks at me and he scratches his head and he says, you know what? It's because experts and seed companies make it sound so complicated. And I never, ever forgot that. And that's one of the reasons why I love to host workshops for gardeners. Now, the thing is, we want a garden that, I mean, we want to be proud of. One that provides heaps of tasty homegrown vegetables and flowers to share with our neighbors and, you know, a relaxing outdoor space. And, well, you know, hosting dinners for friends and a fun space for growing peas and carrots with the kids and grandkids. And so I just want to show you these pictures here. Like this is from Dorothy in Montreal. She was one of my students in my compost academy class. And she lives in Montreal in a tiny apartment. This is her garden. And for her, this was like a major part of her life. She got such relaxation and joy from just having this garden. And this is a special garden from Hazel in British Columbia. And she took my compost academy class. And for her, it was really important to get the seed starting right because they were looking at hotter and hotter summers. So not only did she take the compost academy class, but she learned about how to start seedlings the right way. So the timing was such that the seedlings were getting in the ground the right time. She knew how to water and take care of them. And this one, this is a fun guy. This is Phil in Montana. He took great pride in building his own seed starting equipment and uh, troughs out of reused materials. He also just loves starting marigolds to surprise his wife. That's Phil in Montana. A very fun, fun, fun time with him in the class. Then we have very, very luscious garden. This is Jane in Minnesota and uh, these avid gardeners. And this one especially, especially um, is kind of near and dear to my heart because this is Susan. She lives in the mountains of British Columbia. She has a lot of tribal duties, teenagers to, ride, to raise. I mean, life was her, for her was pretty stressful. So she took my compost academy class and learned how to use organic gardening methods for her seedlings. She wanted to boost her garden so she had a place to relax. And she reminded me of how much we have in common. I mean, we all just want to know like true happiness, relaxation and freedom. Well, freedom from just suffering or the news or anything like that that we deal with here these days. Then there's, well, this is kind of fun. Leslie lives on the prairie and she also lives on the prairie with a bunch of <laughs> deer. So for her, um, surviving 
for the seedlings was very important. So she put up this giant fence. So when I first started gardening, it was all about trying to grow anything for me. And I'll show you what I mean. Because I had to start with not quite a prairie, but I had to start with a bare patch of ground. I mean, I had to start learning how everything, soil, seeds. So I persevered and I managed to grow a few things. And by the time, you know, I got a few things, a few knowledge bits. For me, really, it was all about reducing our grocery bill. Uh, <laughs> well, this is my this is what my first attempt looked like. And fortunately, even after a few years, we eventually improved the soil and everything and built raised beds. And I really started to drill down and began experimenting with what didn't work for seedlings and what did. But my dream garden almost came to a grinding halt because of a medical scare that really shocked our life. So I want to just tell you a quick story here because I remember it like it was yesterday. See, my husband and I, Marty and I, we were traveling in our motorhome in the Southwest. It's kind of retro, I know, it's kind of a retro motorhome. And uh, we had a great time hiking. We went on bird watching trips. We learned about red rocks and arches and we shared coffee and, you know, watching sunrises together. Best way to drink coffee, by the way. And then we were able to stay in some beautiful national parks. Like this is Capitol Reef in Utah. And uh, one night, we couldn't find a camping place in Capitol Reef. So the guy at the camp campground station there the ranger station said, if you just come back at about eight o'clock in the morning, then most people are leaving at that point. And then you can kind of just pull in because it's first come first serve. So what Marty and I did is we left the campground, we drove down the road a little bit, and we went to some, um, it's called BLM land where you can park for free. So we pulled over and we put the motor home up kind of for the night. And um, but for a little hike, we came back in, we had dinner. And then after dinner, uh, Marty got on the phone and he's talking to his daughter, Amy, in Alabama, and I'm on my laptop. I'm typing up something. And then while Marty is talking on the phone, um, he starts talking gibberish. You know, like, you're not making any sense. And I said to myself, oh, my God, Marty is having a stroke. So um, I'm trying to think of my first aid training, right? And... Um, I think, okay, there's this, there's these cues you're supposed to do. I said, okay, Marty, hang up the phone. I said, um, let's see what to do, what to do. I said, Marty, what day is it? And he, he couldn't say. I said, what's your name? Like this. Where are we, Marty? I said, Marty, smile. You're supposed to do that. Smile to see if there's, you know, lopsidedness. So we kept doing this. And then 10 minutes later, Marty, what's your name? Marty, where are we? And he said, Reef, as in Capital Reef. So thank God. But thing was, that wasn't that wasn't the end of it because it was Saturday night, it was pitch black, and the nearest hospital was something like, I don't know, 40, 70 miles away along winding roads. So we had to stay put. And that Sunday morning, next morning, uh, we're driving. And we're listening to uh, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, I think, because we're in Utah, right? And I'm just praying, God, let there be a physician at this hospital. So we pulled in. Five hours later, um, the physician says, well, Marion, your husband's, yes, had a mini stroke. Five hours of test later, right? And um, she says, when you get home, make an appointment with your doctor. Now, back in Kodiak, Marty's doctor gave it to us straight. I remember he's leaning forward. Stop eating meat, he says, and eat more fruits and vegetables. And you know what? That's when I realized I've become pretty complacent about my gardening, pretty lazy. 
I could garden better. I knew I could garden better. And by then, science had proven that organically grown food does contain more nutrients. So I know at that point, I just launched into expanding and boosting our garden into like a veggie factory, starting my own seeds like crazy and growing my own transplants as if, well, my life depended on it and Marty's life depended on it too. So today, this is what the garden looks like. It's just flourishing and I'm able to grow like every square inch of vegetables and I mix them up with flowers and herbs too, just because it makes everything look so pretty. So what did I learn from decades of growing seedlings? <laughs> yeah, see my gray hair? Yeah, check out the gray hair, you guys. Um, by the way, in the chat, anybody know what this leaf is? Put it in the chat if you think you know what this leaf is that I'm holding up here. So I realized that, you know, sprinkling seeds on top of dirt is easy. Anybody can do that. But raising super healthy seedlings that really thrive out in your garden, I realize that it takes, it takes following a method that all gardeners, I think, that grow seedlings, they just want seedlings have, to have what it takes to grow, really. It's like a method, like a path or something, so they can grow up to be the strongest, healthiest spinach. Yes, Catherine, great. Pauline, charred, close, close. Comfrey, we'll talk about that in a little bit. That's a good one. Spinach. So once you put a method to work, you can get the same results time and time again. And that's what I work so hard to do. So that's been like almost 40 years. And I found that just literally changed how I garden. So since those early years, right, this is what I've done. And, uh, I've taught workshops in person, online like this one. I love seeing gardeners like you succeed. And for 27 years, I've written a weekly organic gardening column. And you can see all kinds of topics. Um, I, I share what books I like, how to use organic material, um, the beginner's mind, because that's where I like to start with, because I know what it's like and then what's really exciting that happened, I just, I just love seeing gardeners succeed. And then I co-authored the New York Times bestseller, Chicken Soup for the Gardener's Soul. Grab a copy of this. If you need some uplifting stories, I'm not just saying that. Um, this, is, this is the book to have next to your bed, let me tell you. But friends now tell me, you're going to laugh at this one. <laughs> I'm a little on the obsessive side when it comes to gardening now. But all, all silliness aside, I find myself in the wonderful and blessed position of helping other gardeners. So if you've been totally bummed out or frustrated or discouraged about starting seeds, I want to show you these seed starting tips just for you. So you can experience gardening that's easier, less stressful, you know, because healthy plants require less tending to. And suddenly, ah, you've got more time. Now, I know many gardeners who struggle to have a garden that they're not a slave to, and that's so important. So let's get into this. Because the simple method I developed, it boosts not only seedlings' health, but the gardener's confidence as well. And I call this method the high five method, which is the very heart of my upstarting seed starting workshop. So the, the biggest, biggest, biggest benefit of this system, it shows you how to have 100% confidence that your seedlings will grow up to be the strongest, healthiest, most vibrant seedlings you've ever had without having to buy expensive equipment and materials, you know, seedlings that look like, like 
like more like this. Okay, you guys ready for this? Pop quiz in the chat. What is growing on the right side here? On the left side is like a, like an Asian green, but on the right, what do you think these little seedlings are? They're some of my favorite, favorite seedlings because they're very, very hardy. You can grow them almost anywhere and they're you know, we thought that uh, kale was a top vegetable. This particular plant has taken over, like pushed kale off the side and is now tops as far as the most nutritional green you can grow. Tracy, you're close. You're close. That's pretty close. So we got cilantro, spinach. Actually, you know what? It's Cress. It's cress. Miner's lettuce is good though. I gotta tell you. So cress is um my favorite. Okay, you ready for this? It is wrinkled, crinkled, crumpled cress. Wrinkled, crinkled, crumpled cress. And I think Johnny's carries it. It's really, really good. So, like I said, um Grow wonderful seedlings that go to grace our gardens and, um, and make us happy. And just like here, even if you have a greenhouse or a hoop house, this all applies because we're just on different schedules, right? I want to show you this one because... Uh, I wanted to show you how far along you can come by doing the right thing at the right time. You know, these pictures I'm showing you here, these are not stock photos. This is my first developed garden, my, my proving grounds, so to speak, pardon the pun, where I really worked on what kind of method to get seedlings to work every time. So there's garlic in here. There's, well, everybody needs a rhubarb bed in the bottom right-hand corner, right? But this was the proving ground. So I want you to be able to go to sleep at night knowing you've done your absolute best. Now, you might be wondering, as you look at these pictures, why don't more gardeners get results like this? Because when it comes to starting seeds and growing seedlings, right, there are three seed starting sinkers. I call them sinkers or mistakes that I see people make. These are common but expensive mistakes. Over and over again, people make these, prob these problems for themselves. So we're going to talk about these three mistakes so you can avoid making them. So let's dig right in. Let's begin with what I call expensive mistake number one. And when I say expensive, by the way, I'm not talking just about money. I'm talking about expense of time, our physical health, and so on. So sinker number one, the wrong seeds. Many people think that kind of across the board, store-bought seeds are, are all good. They're all equally good. The problem is that not all the information you need to make a good buying decision is there. It can totally happen that your seeds just don't germinate. Again, it's not always your fault though. Okay, let's go to number two. Seed starting sinker number two. Handling tiny seeds incorrectly. So the problem, the mistake is, I mean, handling too many or too many tiny seeds, small seeds at a time. You can waste seeds, like spilling on the floor, done that. Or you get contamination by accidentally mixing seeds in the packets. And then if you spill, not just on the floor, but where you're actually sowing them, overcrowding when planting seeds is a problem because Separating out those tangled roots can lead to transplant shock. And just like when I was growing broccoli seedlings and I stressed them out with not watering them, tangled roots, while they might look good for a little while, is pretty, it can be disastrous because a plant grows right at the tip, the root tips. That's where all the action is. Okay, let's go to number three. 
and we're going to cover all these. The wrong potting soil. Mistake is most people think that seedlings should be grown in sterile potting soil. Sterile. The problems? Seedlings are not prepared for the real garden soil, real garden dirt. And once transplanted outside, seedlings are more susceptible to pests. And we're going to talk about all this. Because we're going to do some problem solving. So let's go to seed starting sinker number one. The wrong seeds. This is what we just covered. So I'm just going to show you this as a reminder. Okay. I want you to be an informed buyer. It sounds like normal, like duh, but hold on, just hang on here. So before you buy, right, before you click the buy button or you go to the rack at your, uh, your favorite, you know, big box store or what have you, you want to know these things. How old are the seeds? And it kind of goes with how are they stored? You know, you go, how old are these seeds? Well, you don't always know on the seed packet. And uh, my friend Renee Shepard of Shepherd's Garden Seeds, she says a lot of these seed companies, um, if, they, if they're not printing, you know, how old the seed is or for 2022, 20, 23, et cetera, then they might have been sitting out in a warehouse for a year or two. How are they stored? Are they stored in uh, cool and dry? Is it damp conditions? Is it, you know, that kind of thing. And it's okay to ask. It's okay to contact somebody and say, hey, I'm just, and it was the germination rate or germinate rate. If you look on the back of a seed packet, it should show you 75%, 80%, and so on. And is dormancy a factor? Seed dormancy is one of those, it's not your fault things, because you don't know if trying to grow those blue poppies is going to work for you because they have to have a cold snap. They have to have a cold period to break germination. So when you sow lettuce seeds in the middle of the summer and they don't germinate, guess what? They don't like it really hot, okay? And is it appropriate for your growing conditions? Back to the blue poppies. Um, I can't tell you how many gardeners in Southern California, they'll, they'll, they'll take a break and they'll go up to Butch Art Gardens of Victoria and they go, whoa, these blue poppies are awesome. I'm gonna buy a packet. Uh, and nothing happens. So it's just not appropriate for the growing conditions, right? Okay, pop quiz. Since we're talking about seeds, what is the largest seed in the world? What is the largest seed in the world? Now put your answer in the chat. Remember, you're among friends. This is cool. No judgment here, right? What is the largest seed in the world? I could do the Jeopardy song. <laughs> you guys can guess. The largest seed in the world. What would that be? I'll give it to you. It's fuzzy. It floats. It grows in the tropics. And the outer shell is shredded and turned into a material that we can use in potting mixes. And that's the coconut. All right. It's the coconut. Pauline got it. All right, Pauline, you're going to have to ring me up because uh, I want to I want to give you a little gift for that one. <laughs> All right. Let's go to number two. Seed starting sinker number two. OK, like I said, problems. Get the right tools. So work in a well-lit, breeze-free environment. I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting older eyes, so I need to have the lights on more often. Practice, of course, reduce your coffee consumption. Um, this is kind of a silly story, but uh, we actually had in our bed and breakfast, we had a man stay with us who was a brain surgeon, and literally. And so when he started training, um, the the doctor who was doing the training looked at his hands they were shaking just a little bit he says no more coffee for you so use seeding tools that are sturdy and really 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 work so let me show you let me show you what i'm talking about so 
One thing that I really like, I'm a huge proponent, is um, for tiny for tiny seeds. See this guy? This is a mini soil cuber. And uh, this one here is probably 30 years old. I actually had to buy it from the UK. And I use it for growing um, tiny seeds because I pack this full of soil that's mixed. Um, and whatever, whatever seed starting soil or germination mix you use. I mean, some people make up their own mix of um, vermiculite, like a finer vermiculite, um, sifted compost, but you don't really need to use a compost yet. Um, you know, that kind of thing. So you just mix it up until it's a consistency of mm, like cooked oatmeal, kind of kind of gooky. And you take your favorite spoon out of the out of the drawer and you just pack it in there. You just pack it in there like this. OK, and then you just on top of whatever tray you're using, just push down like this and spring loaded. And then you've got like a big a big brownie of 20 little cubes. And that's what you can then put your single seed in or a clump of seeds. And so here's here's how I like to deal with small seeds. So first you get a number two pencil. Yeah, and this really is a pencil because it does write. Yeah, it does. So and then I'm going to demo with some uh, Crush Special K cer cereal here. And I want to show you this because it's really hard to pick up. I mean, there's those little things you kind of tap, tap that, those little things that hold seeds. And But this is the cat's meow for me, is I can just pick up like one seed at a time. Let's get this here. There we go. See, this could be a tomato seed. This could be, this is what I use for tomatoes. But um, yeah, I use this pretty much for tomatoes. I grow so many tomatoes, but it's so easy to pick up one seed or... If you have tiny seeds like poppies, I grow clumps, clumps of poppies, like three to five poppy seeds in one of those little cubes um, for a fundraiser. So we have our public radio station. We host a, a seedling sale, right? And that's what I use to, to grow thousands of poppies. So um, if you have questions, remember, pop them in the chat and we'll get to that at the end, okay? Okay, get the right tools. Now, the wrong potting soil. All right. This is a biggie, you guys. The wrong potting soil. This is a reminder, because we talked about this briefly. We were told by the experts not to use sterile potting soil. Good potting soil needs to contain this one ingredient, okay? Remember I said how in the beginning, it's it's not your fault. So-called experts giving you that kind of what they thought was the right thing to, to say or share or... So he, this is one of them. Now I want you to kind of hold on to your seat because we're going to bust a couple myths today. First of all, myth number one. Seed starting and potting mixes should be sterile to prevent damping off disease. Here is myth number two. But you know, like if you're like me, this is what I was told. You didn't get seeds or any kind of seed starting mix close to uh, garden soil, just, just sterile soil. So here's number two. Don't use soil from the garden. Again, you know, it may come, it might cause damping off disease. And just to clarify, there are several things that cause damping off. For one, not enough air circulation. So here's a greenhouse, it's a winter greenhouse, just barely starting. Um, my greenhouse, my hoop houses are high tunnels. Uh, 24 seven, the fans are on 24 seven. Same thing should be for your seedlings, whether you grow them um, in a garage, on shelving units, whatever it happens to be, you've got to have some kind of air circulation 24 seven. If you have your lights plugged into an outlet, a timer, I mean, then 
make sure that your fans are still running 24 seven. Your lights can go on and off, but keep the fans running. And I'm showing you this slide because um, one of the things that people love to do, garters in particular, we like to repurpose stuff. And cups, yogurt containers, cottage cheese co containers, all of that are very, very popular. I mean, I understand that. But what's really important in considering air circulation for preventing damping off disease is to make sure that the soil comes as close to the top of your containers as possible. We call this gap from the top down to the deck, so to speak, or the soil freeboard on boats and ships they used to work on. So when I talked to Ed Hume later after that radio show we did years ago, remember Ed, I talked about Ed, he said one of the problems that people starting seeds have is that the soil sits down a little further and a little further and you get this dead air space around your seedlings. And remember, um, damping off will hit a seedling right at the point of soil. So anyway, I went and talked to my friend, Jeff Lowenfels, and I asked him a question about healthy soil. I said, so Jeff, what is the best soil for raising seedlings? Now, Jeff, I gotta tell you, uh, it's kind of here. Um, he said, the microbes in living soil are almost always diverse enough to keep the fungi, 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 that cause damping off in check. So Jeff Lowenfels, by the way, has the longest running gardening column in the United States. So I figured he was an authority on this. And he's also written like, I don't know, four books worth checking into, particularly the one, um, on either side, I like teeming with microbes and teeming with bacteria. So if you want to take a little screenshot of this or something, go for it because uh, he's an authority. And there's also a New York Times article written about Jeff. Uh, it's a little side comment here because um, in the 40 plus years he's been writing a gardening column, he's tracked climate change. So the New York Times article is very, very inspiring. So anyway, I went to Jeff and I said, what is the best soil for starting seeds? He said, finished compost is the best potting mix you can use. Now I underlined finished compost because I'm gonna give you a little tip here for those of you that make compost or buy compost or whatever you do, finished compost is important because compost that is not finished can actually harm tender seedlings and plants and prevent um, germination, okay? So Jeff also said, now this, this might kind of blow you away. He said, living soil allows bacteria to help plants take up nutrients more efficiently. Now, I'm not gonna get into the heavy science here because soil science is pretty new. He says, but if you use sterile soil, Bacteria cannot help your seedlings until the microbial herd is established. So the small part of it is that underground, all that action happens around the root tips and bacteria comes in and out of those root tips and the plant is able to, how should I say, farm the nutrients off the bacteria. It's just like the UPS guy coming to your door and saying, okay, got a package for you. It's so, it's, I mean, if I had another life, I would go into soil science. So when you transplant your seedlings, right? Make sure I get the right slide here. When you transplant your seedlings, then you're getting in your soil what, I mean, it all ties together because this picture might look a little out of place for a seed starting workshop, but hear me out. So I told Jeff, I said, microbes in soil. I said, growing plants in living soil, like loaded with nutrients, is like our is like our gut microbiome. And this is like new medical science for humans, right? And Jeff said, 
Yeah, you're right. That's how we maintain a healthy garden too. So uh, just a little side comment here, you guys. You just never know what you're going to learn in these live, these live workshops, right? Okay. So like I said, um, this is my, my, my proving ground. This is where I learned what it takes to grow seedlings, healthy seedlings, time and time again. So we've just learned the three important keys to successful seed starting. So just imagine, I mean, just think, you can even close your eyes, I wouldn't be offended. What would life be like to go out into your garden in the morning and expect to see vibrant, glowing, healthy plants? So at this point, you have a choice. You can take the information we've learned today and you can implement it on your own, or you can keep this momentum going with you with something very special I've created for my 40 years of organic gardening. I mentioned it early in the workshop, and that's to join me for my Seed Starting Secrets workshop. But you might be wondering, of course, well, Marion, how much will the Seed Starting Secrets workshop cost? So before we get into the cost, I want to share with you some of the free bonuses I have. For example, like five free bonuses, really. And this one, organic fertilizers, this is like from making compost to brewing up your own fish fertilizer to the amazing power of comfrey. Now somebody like Evelyn, I think you mentioned comfrey, right on. Uh, my friends in the UK say there's no self-respected gardener that would not have their own clump of comfrey growing like whoa and this is a 21 dollars value and when you act today and i'll show you what to do in a little bit and um for today it is not 21 dollars; it's free and then what's really cool is how to grow seedlings on windowsills. We all love to do this at some point. I mean, we run out of room. We just don't have the space. We don't have a garage. So we do it in a windowsill. So this is like the ultimate guide. Um, if you're short on growing space, or growing in low light conditions, how to grow seedlings on windowsills. Value of $19 and for today, it is free. Bonus number three, non-toxic remedies for pests and diseases. This is my culmination of, it's like an indispensable Bible and it delivers over like remedies you can make at home to help your plants overcome like this cocktail of slugs and bugs and um, nematodes. And just think of how much time and energy you spend every year trying to solve pest problems. Should I use this? Should I use that? And you end up guessing what to do. And often... Bummer, you end up feeling guilty because you've resorted to chemicals, kind of desperate. And that's sad because every day science is revealing to us, I mean, how pesticides and I mean, fungicides damage our bodies, our food and our world. So this value of $22, yours for free. Bonus number four, how to shop smart when buying seeds and seedlings. And this is another indispensable guide because this is what you want to have in your pocket or on your phone, under your notes. Um, these are important things you want to add to the top of your shopping list so you can save money. We talked about this a little bit earlier, what to ask, what to know about buying seeds, but also about seedlings and how you can know if the seedling you're going to buy is stressed or not. But rather than you guys going home and being gypped, that's why I created this guide. So it's $17 value, and for day, it's just a little zero as in free. All right, bonus number five. 
Escorting, that's what I use instead of transplanting, sort of. Escorting your seedlings through the transplanting process. Remember, so they don't just survive, they thrive. And beyond, in through the season, the rest of the season. And for you, for today, it's free. And then finally, the workshop itself, the Seed Starting Secrets Workshop and Workbook, a value of $89. And for today, looking at this, just for today, the value of the bonuses and this personalized course, because it's one and a half hour, it's one and a half hours, it's a workbook, all these bonuses taught by me, a $300 value, it would be a complete steal. But you're not going to pay $300. You're not going to pay $100. When you decide to enroll today in the Seed Starting Secrets Workshop, you're getting access to everything I've mentioned. At $49, this is what you're going to get. But first, let's look at what other gardeners are saying. I would say get off the fence and do it if you can because there are things that Marianne showed me that I never even thought of. Things I probably could have thought of but I didn't. <laughs> get off the fence. <laughs> do you have any questions about what you should do in your yard or what you need to do for plants? Um, or vegetables, you really should take Marian Owen's class. I'm a greenhorn, not a green thumb. And um, I took the class because I wanted to know what I'm doing wrong in my own space. Because after years and years of uh, spending hundreds of dollars on soils, uh, perennials and annuals, um, I realized something wasn't right. And I found out what was, wasn't was right. I mean, I had little bits of information, but as we know, little bits of information is probably not enough. And I'm growing perennials where annuals should be. This is what I found out. And I'm growing annuals where perennial should be. And I have some information, but she helped put me on the right path. And today I'm going to devise a plan and she's going to be my mentor for this. And I'm very, very excited, very excited. And what I'm really excited about is, as much as I enjoy my mess of a garden, I'm excited that it's going to, I'm going to put some uh, order to it. And I'm one that loves order. Um, and so I'm excited about that. And I hope you are too. has a wonderful teaching style. She's knowledgeable, entertaining, and she cuts through all the misinformation, contradictions, and confusions that are out on the internet and on YouTube about gardening. She'll work with you directly to address your specific needs and situation, and I highly recommend her lectures and her classes. She's a real person that you can email or connect with or you know, set up a Zoom call with throughout the course, and she welcomes all questions and answers them thoughtfully and knowledgeably. And that just goes such a long way in, uh, in our learning process. Exciting, because for me, just seeing the transformation with these gardeners just makes it all worthwhile whether it's seedlings or compost or planting their garden. And to sign up for uh, this Saturday's workshop, because it starts um, this Saturday, there is the website right there. And 
It's 90 minutes of live training with me plus five free bonuses. Five free bonuses. That's a tongue twister. Total value is $179. And for today, for today, it's just $49. So special invitation for you. So when you click on that little button, when you go to that gardenerscoach.com slash workshop, you find the green button there, see on your desktop and on your phone. And um, when you click on that green button, this is where you'll go. It follows with a red button. <laughs> so gardenerscoach.com slash workshop. All righty. And... Uh, we're going to get right to your questions. All right. Some of you have asked um, uh, when the workshop starts. So remember, it's Saturday, and that's this Saturday, February 18th. And that'll be at 4 p.m. Pacific time. 4 p.m. Pacific time. All right. Uh, let's see here. And then also, um, if you can't attend the workshop live, no problem, because um, it'll be recorded and available. If you pay for the course, it'll be available for you. And is there a guarantee? A lot of people have asked this. There is a guarantee. You are, uh, how should I say? You're protected by my 100%, no questions asked. Um, refund because if for any reason you're not satisfied with the course just send me a little email and uh, no problem all righty let's see what else we got uh, another question here I have um, what are the easiest types of seeds for beginners I would say these would be like fast growing seeds it might be your salad greens I would do salad greens or mixed salad greens or braising mixes, ones that you can uh, stir fry. And it might be a blend of lettuce and kale. Yes, just baby kale greens. Um, Chinese greens, um, the cress I talked about, the wrinkled, crinkled, crumpled cress, these blends. Sometimes, you know, I'll look at my seed packets like this and I'll have some from last year. And what I do is I just mix them up on my own. You can also buy uh, mixed seeds, they're very popular. Um, how do you prevent fungal infection on your seedlings? Edward asks. One thing I do is um, when the seedlings start to grow and I, and I feel like they have root structure that might be able to reach down, I start watering them um, from the bottom as much as possible. The other thing I do, and what I forgot to bring is I actually take a, like a dinner fork and then I put it in a vise and then I bend the tip over just about, you know, less than a quarter inch. And I use that to kind of scratch the top of the soil. And that keeps different things from, from growing on the soil. As far as fungal infections, when I start to show uh, some fungus in any plant, small or big, I actually use... One thing I do use is cinnamon. I'll take powdered cinnamon, cinnamon and I'll sprinkle it on the soil and on the plant itself. So air, air circulation helps a lot. And the other thing that we kind of forget because we don't always have enough time, we think, is to check your plants a lot and separate them out. So there's good air circulation in between your seedlings. Okay. Good question. I live in an apartment. Do I need a large garden? You don't need a large garden, but here are some solutions if you do live in an apartment. If you have a deck, um, like our friend Gardner in Mo Montreal, is to go vertical as much as possible if you don't live in too windy of a spot. Another thing is to ask a friend if your friend has room in their garden where you can have a row or a raised bed. Look for a community garden plot. And the other trick is to um, get into succession planting. And I learned this from an Italian gardener who actually has a garden near railroad tracks in, in, in Italy. And he said, we're very careful that when something comes out, 
something goes in. So you don't need a lot of space. You just have to use the space well. So if you have like even two little containers, if you know that in about two weeks or three weeks, this particular plant will be done, then already have growing in the background are seedlings that are ready to go in. So I hope that makes sense. Okay, what else we got here? Um, what tools do I need? I would say um, for starts is to have your containers kind of set up. I'm just kind of, I'm gonna show you here in a second. I use for my seed starting of tiny seeds. I When I go to the grocery store in the winter, though I am eating greens right now, I'm really excited and it's already middle of winter. So if I use a soil cuber to put squares of seeds on this, this is just a tray from, it's a, a lid to those greens you buy in the grocery store, right? So I just use this lid for starting my seeds. When it's time to, you'll need your seed starting mix, of course. Um, when it's time to pot them up, I use these little six packs or four packs. I'm very careful to reuse these because as gardeners, we have a responsibility to send the message that too many of these, like plastic, we gotta stop using plastic so much. Or what you can do is fill a container like this with vermiculite, medium grade is best, not too fine, not too coarse, but medium grade. And um, I, I water from the bottom, so it's in a tray, water from the bottom, it goes, and it soaks up the water. I sprinkle, say, marigold seeds on top, and then I cover it with more vermiculite. Very inexpensive. You don't have to go fancy here. And um, then that's how I start marigolds. And then I use my pencil. I want to use a giant one. So when it comes time to pick them out or prick them out, I use a pencil. Same with my um, my tiny seeds that I grow in the in the little cubes. Yep. All right. And I think somebody had asked about, all right, so um, how will this workshop be taught? It'll be a Zoom call and an hour and a half, and I'll, it'll be Q&As as well. So like this one, Q&As are, I love doing Q&As. It puts me on the spot. I make sure I use deodorant and have a good time. Um, if you have questions after the workshop, I welcome questions after the workshop, absolutely. And if, and if I can't answer the question, I'll find a source where I'm confident with sharing that with you. So is now a good time of the year to start sowing seeds? I would say any time of year is good. Uh, for me and my schedule here in Kodiak, Alaska, I've already started my first ones to start are leeks, uh, onions, or even green onions, but uh, your bulbing onions. Now, one thing about onions that people don't realize is that onions are one of those plants that are very affected by day length. A short day onion, as in a short day, uh, would be like a Vidalia onion, like in Georgia, like a sweet onion, which doesn't store as well. A neutral day onion, as in equal day and night, is more like uh, lower southern Canada, northern United States. And then a long day onion, which is what we deal with up north because we have long days. Um, that's what you want to get is for a long day onion, for, by the way. And um, long day onions are harder. They're much more tart and they store better. A Vidalia onion, on the other hand, uh, is sweeter. You can eat it almost like an apple, but it does not store well. Uh, so that's that's what I would do is figure out when you're going to start your onions or excuse me, your um, plants that take the longest and then stagger it. So your biggest group of starting seeds indoors is probably going to be your kale, your cabbage. Um, some people have luck with transplanting corn. I don't know. Um, and uh, then what I do is I actually start my cucumbers inside. And I have to be very, very careful when I transplant them to take as much soil with the roots as possible because cucumbers are one of those plants that 
do not like be disturbed. So I want to talk one thing about um, transplanting plants. Um, your coal crops, that is your cabbage variety plants, they like being buried down to the neck where this, this, the leaves start and to not have the whole stem above the soil level. So here's my, here's my hairbrush, right? So we're going to pretend that this is the stem and then these are the leaves, right? And here are the roots. So in growing in the seed starting medium, they're like this. You've got all the stem showing and you've got this clump here where you're going to get your uh, leaves growing from. And what you want to do when you transplant it outside, you want to plant it to there. You don't want all this stem flopping around. Just plant it like this, really deep. It'll be nice and stout. However, for lettuce, you don't want to plant it too deep. If you plant it too deep, you'll, you'll get what's called crown rot right here. If you bury that too deep, like accidentally, then you'll come out one day and you go, uh, what's, what's going on here? My lettuce plant is completely flopped over. Then you pick up the lettuce plant and go, oh, it just rotted right there at the soil. Okay. This is true for onions too. You can plant them too deep. And maybe I'm getting into this too much, but let me know in the chat if I'm getting into this too much. But I'm pretend I've got an onion seedling here. Oh yeah, we'll just bring this brush back. Okay, so your onion has like a like a, a white uh, area here, and this is gonna be your greenery. If you plant your onion too deep, where you're burying all the white, then guess what? You won't have bulbing onions. You're not gonna get onions that look like this, right? I've been trialing, trialing, I've been testing uh, onion seeds, red onion seeds, just because I love red onions, right? So I found from a pro professional, like onion grower in the in interior of Alaska, and I was actually on my phone at the time out in the garden, and I said, uh, what's the deal? Um, I'm not getting onions. I'm getting what look like giant leeks. And um, he said, well, I learned the hard way because I had a bunch of students here, grad students, helping me transplant these onion seedlings everywhere, you know, green on the top and the white and then the roots. He said, and they were putting them too deep. They were burying them too deep. So what happens is you, you don't get onions. You just get these giant fat kind of greenery goes into the white and that's it. So when I transplant onions, I have just barely the roots in the soil and everything else is above. So when they talk about onions being a root crop, no, nah, I, I think it's more like a stem crop. So uh, Jean says, do I need to be an experienced gardener to start? No, no. I mean, all you got to do is just pay attention. That's really all it is. You can, you can start with just minimal equipment and um, just grow some seeds, maybe just the things you, you like to eat. Just pick maybe three vegetables, okay? Or just two and maybe some flowers and um, get your soil right and uh, just pay attention to what they need. In my Seed Starting Secrets workshop, I, I go through the whole list of what it's like to think like a plant, as in what do your seedlings need? It's not always what we think they need because our brains, right? We just try and give them what they need. It's kind of like having, it's kind of like having a puppy. You're raising a puppy. You can't just put the puppy in the corner in a cage. You've got to pay attention to that puppy. Oh, time to go outside. Oh, time to, you know, time to eat. But paying attention to your plants will be your biggest, biggest asset. So is it expensive to get started? No, it's not. You can, I mean, you might even have friends that have containers. For example, I've got friends that say, hey, Marion, my favorite container is like tofu containers. Or you can just get, these are what mushrooms came in at the store. Um, and pencils, Gardner's best friend. You can actually um, have a seed swap with your, your friend Gardner's. And you know, you might be buying too much seeds and you can share with someone else and back and forth. Um, you don't need expensive shop lights. 
screw that stuff. You just need fluorescent shop lights, just basic fluorescent shop lights or LEDs. They're now replacement. Those are more expensive, but they last longer. So start them in the windowsill in the Seed Starting Secrets workshop. One of the bonuses, remember, is all about how to grow in a windowsill. So, okay, if um, how do you know if your old seed is still good? That's a very good question, Wendy. So thing is, can't always trust the seed packet. What I do is I take um, a piece of paper towel. It's eluding me right now, but you take a piece of paper towel. Well, how about this? So here's a piece of paper. This is a paper towel. Get it nice and wet and um, we'll actually fold it like this first. You wanna put about 10 seeds or, or any number of seeds, you know the number. And you just fold over the paper towel like this, right? And then get it damp and mark the date and you slip it inside of a Ziploc bag and seal it up. And every few days, just check on it. And when they start to germinate and you're confident that that's all that's gonna germinate, then um, open up the paper towel and count, do your math and you'll know a percentage of how many uh, germinated. I'd say if it's 75% and above, it's good. And if it's 75% and below, don't throw the seeds out, just, just sow more, right? Just be aware of, you know, some seeds, like I buy fresh onion seeds every year because the germination rate on onion seeds, even when you buy fresh seeds from reputable firms like Johnny Seeds in Maine, if it says 75 to 80%, you know, you already know that this kind of suffers. Whereas a bean seed, pea seeds, they can last for years. So it's kind of the brief part of how to know. How long do seeds last? That's a good one. I should have brought my little cheat sheet with me. Um, like I said, beans and peas, a long time. Remember, they, they, they've collected, scientists have found beans in earthen pots in, in caves in the Southwest and they still germinate. Um, I would say lettuce seeds, two or three years was what I go for, broccoli, cabbage, kale seeds, I'd hang on to to no, no longer than say three years. Thing is too though, is if it's a really important crop for you, then consider buying them pretty timely. Make sure that you either put the date on there if it's not already stamped on the seed packet so you know when you bought them and that helps that helps a lot and germination tests help a lot as well so great questions everybody great questions is your workshop for beginners or do i need to have an established garden it's absolutely for beginners i'm i love the beginner's mind because when i moved to alaska i knew nothing and i came from washington state where you know, just about anything grows short of maybe cantaloupe. <laughs> I knew nothing. I had a total blank, like, like clear, clear blank beginner's mind. So I bumbled my way through it. And I'm glad I started that way. If you're a seasoned green thumber um, like this, if you have a green thumb already, then welcome because between all of us, you, me, and, and everybody else in the workshop, uh, we'll learn something. I always learn something and that's part of the beginner's mind and the advanced mind to have is your cup to be empty so that you're available to new information, new knowledge. Yeah. Okay. Any last questions? Um, I hope to see you in the seed starting secrets workshop. It is my honor and I just absolutely love to share my experience and learn of your experience in these workshops. It's a complete pleasure for me. So um, thank you very much for joining me this afternoon for here and um, blessings to you and happy, happy gardening. Cheers.